<laughs> Good evening, everyone. Well, that's embarrassing. Let me go ahead and um, get started. Thank you for having us here this evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Greg Slater. I'm the secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation. Just want to thank Wacomico County for, for having us here today and, and hosting us. It's always a great uh, evening to come down and break some bread together and see a presentation and kind of talk about shared priorities. But uh, we are here and we're going to provide an overview of our draft six year consolidation, consolidated transportation program. Uh, it covers fiscal years 22 to 27. So first I want to introduce the team that is with me here today from the State Highway Administration. We have uh, Administrator Tim Smith and our District Engineer Jay Meredith. I was getting ready to make fun of him because I thought he was hiding. I tried. <laughs> I got cold. <laughs> from the Maryland Transportation Authority, we have Capital Planning Director Melissa Williams. From the Maryland Transit Administration, we have Local Transit Support Director Travis Johnston. From the Motor Vehicle Administration, we have Administrator Christy Neiser. From the Maryland Aviation Administration, we have Regional Aviation Assistance Director Ashish Solanki. And from the Secretary's Office, we have Regional Planner Tyson Byrne and our Director of Government Affairs, Pilar Helm. I don't have to remind everyone, but uh, 2020 was a pretty challenging year for all of us. Uh, the pandemic led to uh, record decreases in travel and a corresponding decrease in our revenues. The good news is in recent months, those revenues have rebounded. Today's travel volumes have reached and in some cases are surpassing the levels that we saw in 2019. During the peak of last year's stay at home order, our traffic volumes dropped more than 50%. In the third week of September, traffic on Maryland highways was down just 7% compared to 2019. On the other hand, with Maryland's economy recovering and the supply train trying to keep up and meet the demand, we saw truck volumes up 9% compared to 2019. At Maryland's toll facilities, transactions so far for September are just above the volumes that we saw in 2019. During the, stay at the, uh, during the peak of the stay at home order, our toll volumes were down 58%. Overall, our passenger volumes at the BWI Thurgood Marshall Airport remain about 25% lower than they were in 2019, uh, as business travel is still lagging a little bit behind some of the leisure travel uh, in that rebound. But the air traffic continues to grow on a weekly basis, and we are outperforming many in our region. The Port of Baltimore has seen a robust economy from the pandemic, reflecting that consumer demand and this growing e-commerce industry. We even hosted Secretary uh, Pete Buttigieg from the USDOT back in July, and uh, it was the first port that he had visited as USDOT Secretary. We recently brought in four massive Panamax cranes to the Port of, Bal port of Baltimore. Uh, it will allow us to service two of the largest ships in the world at the same time. Uh, I can tell you that those cranes are large and effective. Uh, I stood on the Bay Bridge when they went under with four feet of clearance. And so uh, we did shut that down for traffic, but it was, uh, it was a nervous morning. I'll put it that way. Yes, yeah, so we, uh, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, yeah. We, did you, the delegate was at the port? They are large, but the Port of Baltimore is truly Maryland's port. Right here in Wacomico County, Purdue, Delmarva Power, uh, and Delmarva Power ship their products through the Port of Baltimore out of here. For more than a year, the Motor Vehicle Administration has operated under an appointment-only model to promote the health and safety of our customers and our employees. During that time, the agency has significantly expanded its online uh, presence and services through our innovative Customer Connect system. As a result, the MVA is now serving more customers online than ever before and seeing more people overall than we ever did before in the appointment-only, very controlled environment. I'm proud of the role our Maryland Transit Administration played during this pandemic. Every single day our transit operator showed up and got our essential workers uh, to uh, and from work. Today, MTA's core services remain consistent. We're getting close to about 70% of our pre-pandemic core bus uh, ridership and the other modes of light rail and metro and mark are recovering a little bit slower, but we recently resumed uh, full schedule service on, on mark and our commuter services. 
Shifting over to the program, uh, the details of the program, I'm pleased to announce today that our draft 22 to 27 CTP totals a $16.4 billion budget. That's a billion dollars more than the six year program that was passed last year. And it's equal to the six year program that we passed in 2019 and to 2024. The largest drivers of this increase and in recovery are the COVID relief funds at about $841 million that came from the federal government, but also uh, revenues that were outperforming by about 488 million. The largest components of that are 255 million of the motor fuel tax and 213 million from titling fees. So people are driving more and people are buying cars. This CTP focuses heavily on system preservation, taking care of the system that we have out there. More than half of this budget, $8.2 billion, is going directly into state of good repair system preservation projects. The funding is critical for our bridges, our rails, our port infrastructure, our airport infrastructure, our facilities. Uh, we need to take care of them and we need to keep making those investments. We're also investing in that next wave of projects, planning and engineering projects for the future. So looking ahead, we do believe we've weathered the worst of the revenue impacts from this pandemic and we're on the road to recovery. Those federal relief funds have really helped us bridge that gap. Uh, the growth is gonna be slow outside of that, but it's gonna be growth. With some of the uncertainty in mind, we're continuing to stretch every dollar. Switching over on the infrastructure side, uh, the reason for that investment in state of good repair is we have a significant backlog of state of good repair in all of our modes. The state of good repair backlog we have today is at $7 billion. Much of our infrastructure was built decades ago and we have to replace it all at the same time. The entire interstate system was built in the late 50s and early 60s. We're building all those bridges again at the same time. We have to focus on that state of good repair. We have a $2 billion backlog of state of good repair in our transit network, $4 billion on our highway network, $750 million in needs uh, at our two main airports, BWI and Martin State, and $100 million in needs at our aging MVA locations that really need to upgrade uh, and modernize, and more than $250 million at our port infrastructure. The whole system is in need of upgrade. But at the same time, we can't just upgrade it. We have to modernize it at the same time. Switching over on the uh, modernization side, uh, we are fully transitioning and working towards our uh, conversion to an electric vehicle fleet. Uh, within this state, we are currently have about 36,000 electric vehicles registered in this state with 1,000 charging stations and 2,700 charger outlets, and that is continuing to grow, uh, starting with the vehicle manufacturers that are starting to make those commitments. Um, but we're in a period where we're gonna have to serve many different vehicles at the same time for quite some time. But as you can tell, state of good repair is a top priority for us. But at the same time, we're gonna continue to focus on building intelligence across our system, delivering infrastructure in a way that incorporates technology and growth and future uh, flexibility, safe and accessible mobility choices for all of our users of our system, our pedestrians, our bicyclists, and really looking at that relationship between land use and transportation in our decisions and establishing that sustainable customer focused transportation vision that connects our roadway, our transit network, our freight network, our airports and our ports, all of that infrastructure interconnected. A big part of how we deliver that vision is gonna believe is gonna come down to some additional federal investment. I'm sure you've all heard we've gotten some aid packages. We benefited from the CARES Act, we benefited from the CRISA Act and the American Rescue Plan of 2021. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of projects that are gonna benefit from those relief packages, starting with our dredge programs, uh, servicing the Marine Highway into the Port of Baltimore, uh, some benefit for our branch offices at the MVA, uh, investments in the Port of Baltimore, and investments in zero emission buses uh, at the MTA. We are closely tracking our actions in the actions in DC today and hopeful that they will come together and uh, not only continue this continuing resolution to keep the government functioning, but also uh, the investment in infrastructure. So we're hopeful that they're gonna come together. They did pass a continuing resolution this afternoon, but unfortunately the surface transportation aspect of that was removed from the bill. And so if the infrastructure bill passes, our transportation program will lapse and they'll have to act tomorrow. 
we're going to continue to focus on that. Recently, Governor Hogan announced $16.8 million in grants to support uh, bike and pedestrian and trail improvements uh, throughout the state. Two of those projects are right here in Wacomico County. Uh, first, uh, thanks to the Transportation Alternatives Program, uh, the city of Salisbury is going to receive more than $597 million to design 8.9 miles of on-street bikeways in 15 key streets, including some pedestrian crossings along the, the roadways. Our facilities will be designed uh, to tie into those existing routes and implementation over the next two years. And also thanks to our recreational trails program, Wacomico County is going to receive a $50,000 grant to construct two stone dust surface trails and trail side amenities for the Pirates Wharf Trail Development Project. We're going to be highlighting those uh, on our social media pages. As I switch over uh, to hear from our, our business unit administrators, I'm going to start with uh, Tim Smith at the State Highway Administration. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, an honor to lead the SHA team. So over the past year, as uh, we've been dealing with the pandemic, our team stayed very focused on construction and maintenance operations, uh, following proper health practices. So. With that, that allowed us to deliver a lot of great projects across the state, and a few of those uh, right here in Wacomico was uh, the Maryland US 13 business, Salisbury Boulevard. We did drainage improvements from north to south Boulevard to north to Calvert Street. We just finished that up this spring. Uh, that an, was an $8.8 .8 million project that included drainage infrastructure, reconstructing sidewalks uh, to current standards, as well as resurfacing. Also in Salisbury, uh, we're advancing work on a $13 million project to uh, build a new Salisbury Boulevard uh, the, along the east branch of the Comico River. Uh, we, we broke this one into two phases. So uh, right now we're very much focused on the utility parts of that. Uh, that's currently going on right now. Um, and then the balance of that project will be re replacing a bit the bridge and we're anticipating that starting uh, in 2023 once the relocations are finished. And uh, Delmar took advantage of our transportation alternatives program and um, was able to receive a $221,000 grant uh, to complete work near Delmar Elementary School. Uh, that was roughly 2,200 feet of curb and sidewalk to connect the school to Maryland 54. And as the secretary mentioned, our current CTP budget is much closer to pre-pandemic levels than it was before. So we're very much focused on building uh, our shelf of projects in anticipation of a, a federal infrastructure funding. So at State Highway, what that really means is three different things. We're focusing on asset management, or state of good repair, as the Secretary mentioned, accessibility, and mobility. So what asset management really means in that state of good repair is taking the best care of our infrastructure, our roadway infrastructure that we can, and meaning uh, making good now decisions about with a long-term vision and a long-term infinite mindset. So getting, trying to get the best in return on our investment and all across all our assets. Accessibility, that's really about projects about all our users, especially our vulnerable users, pedestrian, bicyclists, those on scooters, as well as motorists. And when the secretary, uh, he started this under, under his leadership and, and when he was in my role, uh, we, had a, we developed a context-driven uh, guide. And what that really means is uh, looking at our projects differently, both from planning and design through construction and maintenance. Uh, but what it really does is provide flexibility into our, our designs and allows us to address major issues from a safety and accessibility standpoint by, while still considering motorists. Um, so that's really a bit, a bit of a culture shift for State Highway. Uh, we've been very much focused on just rural or urban, and now we have a full context of different um, contexts we're looking at from urban core to suburban. And we realize there's pedestrian and bicycle movements in rural and suburban areas as well. So we need to build that into our designs. And uh, as like, uh, I can say this because I'm an engineer, uh, we, we need to be a little more nimble with our decisions and, and make sure we're, 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 we're moving forward with uh, considering everyone's context there. But I know uh, looking at those procedures through the lens of the context guide, as well as through a vision zero goal, uh, we can make our roadway safer for everyone. Secretary mentioned it, but mobility is really about uh, modernizing our, our, our roadways, but uh, building in uh, the ability to use uh, intelligent transportation systems. So it's really about using our existing footprint and being able to safely move more vehicles safer. Uh, uh, so we'll be looking at opportunities to use adapt adaptive signals, uh, use uh, additional cameras, sensors in our roadway to, for cue detect detection and as well as speeds to make adjustments 
um, on our roadway to make folks uh, be able to travel safer and more expediently. So in closing, as we kind of navigate uh, both the coming out of the ad addressing from the pandemic, both from a, a budget perspective, but also as a mental perspective, uh, we're very much, State Highway will continue to work collaboratively with our partners and stakeholders to maintain a safe and reliable transparent uh, and transportation system. But part of that is looking at it from a fiscal responsibility perspective uh, from our internal resources. So we're making some adjustments in both organizationally as well as business processes uh, to make sure we're, uh, we're meeting our mission in, a, in the most effective way. So thank you for your time, and I'm going to turn it over to our partners over at MDTA, Melissa Williams. Thanks, Tim. This past year, the MDTA made great progress in preserving Maryland's toll facilities and developing projects and studies to serve Marylanders in the future. The Bay Bridge Automated Lane Closure System, the ALCS, is a project constructed for opening and closing lanes for two-way traffic operations on the bridge. The ALCS will enhance the current manual system for motorists by allowing maintenance crews to remotely implement and discontinue two-way traffic on the Bay Bridge's eastern and western shores. The ALCS will include overhead lane use control signals, dynamic message signals, horizontal swing gates, and illuminated pavement markers. Work on the project, such as conduit boring and installation, began in February of 2020 on the Eastern Shore and January 2021 on the Western Shore. The ALCS project includes reconstructing and realigning US 50 eastbound in the former Toll Plaza area. In the fall of 2022, the automated lane closure system will be in place in both directions. In February, the Tier 1 Draft Environmental Impact Statement for, <clears throat> I'm sorry, for the, uh, was made available, I'm sorry, for the Chesapeake Bay Crossing Study was made available for public review and comment at baycrossingstudy.com. The MDTA held in-person and virtual public hearings in April and the comment period ended in May. We expect to identify a selected corridor alternative and publish a combined final environmental impact statement record of decision in the winter of 2021-2022. The MDTA implemented temporary all-electronic tolling statewide in March of 2020 as part of its COVID-19 response, and we made all electronic tolling permanent in August of 2020. Construction for highway speed all-electronic tolling on new and new gantries and the removal or partial removal of the existing toll plazas is underway, underway at the Fort McHenry Tunnel, JFK Memorial Highway, and the Nice Middleton Bridge. A study is underway for the I-895 Baltimore Harbor Tunnel Toll Plaza and interchange improvements, which will also allow MDTA to bring highway speed all electronic tolling to the Harbor Tunnel. The MDTA launched Drive Easy MD, the new home for all things tolling in Maryland. The April launch of Drive Easy MD includes a new website, web chat, customer call center <coughs> with expanded hours, text notifications, and more. Customers can now pay their tolls with EasyPass, pay-by-plate, or <coughs> video tolling. EasyPass Maryland customers continue to receive the lowest toll rates with savings up to 77%. More features such as additional vehicle classes with lower toll rates and a mobile app are coming soon. Lastly, major ongoing statewide projects also include the $1.1 billion I-95 Express Toll Lanes Northbound Extension Program to relieve congestion and improve travel along the I-95 corridor northeast of Baltimore. Construction began in May on the major project to widen northbound 95 between Maryland 43 White Marsh Boulevard and Maryland 152 Mountain Road to make way for the extension of two northbound express toll lanes. The extension is expected to open to traffic by 2024 up to 152 with the full extension to north of Maryland 24 open to traffic by 2027. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Travis with MTA. Thank you, Melissa. Good evening. MTA is one of the largest multimodal transit systems in the United States, operating a local bus and commuter bus network, as well as light rail link, metro subway link, marked train service, a comprehensive mobility paratransit system, and by supporting the locally operated transit system statewide. The agency's goal is to provide safe, efficient, and reliable transit across Maryland with world-class customer service. The COVID-19 health crisis highlighted the critical role transit plays in connecting the region's residents to employment, healthcare, 
education, and other essential services. MTA makes a significant investment in transit in Wicomico County by providing $5 million in operating and capital grants to the Tri-County Council of the Lower Eastern Shore to support shore transit. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Tri-County Council of the Lower Eastern Shore will receive $8 million in federal relief funds to support transit operations and or capital needs of the county as provided by Shore Transit. MTA is preparing for the future of transit and is currently undertaking the first 50-year statewide transit plan. The draft plan is expected to be available for public comment by the end of 2021. Building upon existing regional and local transit plans across the state, the plan will outline a 50-year vision for transit in Maryland and help define transit needs across the state for future generations. We look forward to continuing to work with Wacomico County and stakeholders across the state to develop this long-term vision and framework for coordinated transit service in Maryland. Thank you. I will now turn it over to our teammate, Chrissy Neiser, MBA. Thanks, Travis, and it's always a pleasure to be here with you. At MDOT MBA, we remain focused on providing that premier customer service, whether it's inside our branch office or through our alternative services. As the Secretary said, um, our branch offices do remain appointment only. However, we've greatly expanded the capacity, and frankly, in some locations, we're a greater capacity <coughs> than we were um, when we had the walk-in transactions. But our online and kiosk services obviously remain a critical part of our growing business and how we serve Marylanders statewide. I will say the last 18 months with all the challenges have enabled us to kind of look at our operations in a different way and figure out are there better ways to do things. I would like to thank the members of the legislature for helping us with some of those things where we needed to change the law. Um, so now you can renew your license a little earlier. It used to be only six months in advance, now it's 12 months. Obviously helps our military, some of our students, folks that may be traveling out of state to take that action early. Also, if you're over 40, you need that vision certification every time you renew, even if you renew outside the branch office. That used to be good only for one year. Um, you know, a doctor signs off, they can either do it by the form or they can submit it electronically. That's now good for two years, so it um, gives you a little bit more of an opportunity to be able to take advantage of our mail-in service or online service. And also, if you need to come visit us um, in between your renewal period because you lost your license or you moved and you need to get that corrected license, um, you can use that photo for your next renewal. So um, previously, we weren't allowed to use that photo. We had to ask you to come back in again, even if you uh, just came in very recently. So we are doing more transactions than ever outside of the branch office. In fact, when we look at the stats from March to August, 2019 compared to this year, we're up 45%. So that just gives you a sense of how significant the changes have been. Part of that is because of our IT modernization project called Customer Connect. We deployed our vehicle um, project in July of 2020 and our driver licensing system will be deployed in December of this year. So we're really excited about the changes coming with that. At full deployment, the Customer Connect system will give us that 360 view of the customer. So the customer will have the ability to log on to their own account, see anything related to their MBA business, the status of their license, if they're a commercial license holder, they'll see that medical certificate, whether it's valid or not, or whether they need to uh, get it up to date. Um, all the information about their vehicles will also be in the same place. So it really puts a lot of information at the customer's fingertips. So we're excited about that. Um, all real-time updates, not some of these um, batch updates that we've done in the past. And so. Um, we think that this will even take us forward uh, from a customer service standpoint, but we're also looking at security issues. We know we have so much information on Maryland residents. Currently, your SoundX number, otherwise known as your driver's license number, it's based on first letter in it, last name, and date of birth. And as, as always happens, people figure out what that formula is, and they create websites that try to allow them to guess what your SoundX number might be. And we recognize that that number is not just used for MBA business, it's also used for many other things. Um, so starting in December, when we roll out the new system, you'll get a new number. The first time you interact with us, it'll be a Maryland ID, start with MD. It'll be uh, randomly generated, so there's no way for somebody to try to figure out anymore what that is. So we think that's a, a nice step forward from a security standpoint. Also for our commercial, commercial driver's license holders, uh, currently their license expires every five years. Uh, once we go live in December, they will have an eight-year license expiration just like the rest of our licensees, so obviously always looking at making it a little bit easier for them. 
I know Real ID has been a topic over the last several years, so just wanted to give you an update there. Um, we're really proud to say we're 82% Real ID compliant in Maryland, which is actually one of the highest percentages in the country. Um, DHS has moved back that deadline because of COVID, so that's now May of 2023, but regardless, we're in really good standing with that, and, and now that we have that additional time, it gives many more Maryland residents the opportunity to come in just during their normal renewal cycle and provide documents. In addition to our customer service focus, obviously highway safety is a priority as it is for, for many of the administrations. And as the Secretary alluded to, I mean, the traffic was down 50%, but the fatalities were the highest since 2008, really alarming things that we're seeing on the roadways with incredibly high rates of speed and dangerous driving behaviors. And so it really um, caused us to redouble our efforts and also just make sure we're we're taking into account the new um, the new norms we're seeing out there and trying to address those issues along with our other partners, including law enforcement. I am happy to say that Governor Hogan did announce some money that's coming here directly to the county, 150,000. So it'll go to law enforcement and other organizations directly to address highway safety. Also, our highway safety office has got a new mm -hmm. campaign called Be the Driver, and it's all about trying to remind everybody that each and every one of us needs to take that personal responsibility every time you get behind the wheel. So I saw some billboards on the way down, which is great. So the various messaging campaigns, if it's about speeding or aggressive driving, you'll see that as kind of the theme behind it. So we're just trying to continue to find creative ways to, to get the word out there. But regardless of whether it's highway safety or customer service, we do strive to do the best we can in everything we do. And I have to say, it's really because of our employees. You know, some of those suggestions I mentioned earlier, they bring those things forward. Um, it's not that we're coming up with all these ideas. And so I'm just really proud because it has been a tough time and they've continued to be there every day delivering that premier customer service to our residents. And I'm so proud of the job they do. So thank you again for your time. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Ashish Shalanki at the Maryland Aviation Administration. Thank you, Chrissy. Good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to join you this evening. Uh, before I jump into my remarks, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, Tony Rudy and his uh, professional staff at the, your local airport. They've uh, done a tremendous job these last 18 months with the pandemic, and uh, we know the challenges here running BWI, Martin State Airport, and wanted to recognize how Salisbury's maintained a safe operational airport here. So thank you. So here at MAA, we've, uh, throughout the pandemic, we have collaborated with state, federal, as well as public health officials and our partners to ensure safe, healthy airports for our customers and employees at BWI Marshall and our Martin State Airports. Our airport community remains focused on providing safe and healthy travel to our customers. The strong recovery that we have experienced reflects the confidence that our customers feel with the safe, comfortable travel throughout. In fact, the recovery at BWI Marshall leads the region with growing passenger traffic and new airline service for the metro area. We are particularly proud of the work our employees have done during the pandemic and the fact that BWI Marshall has received the top North American airport recognition in its size and category for the 2020 Airport Service Quality Award. This ASQ program recognizes global airports for delivery of the best customer service as measured by our passengers. To receive this airport during the pandemic, one of the most challenging periods in our history, is a remarkable achievement. Throughout the pandemic, we have continued to provide innovation and provide new services and amenities for our passengers. Like the $48 million five-gate extension to Concourse A that offers new food and retail concessions, upgraded restrooms, and more capacity to Southwest Airlines. And our new state-of-the-art electric vehicle charging stations, which are an important collaboration with BGE to boost charging infrastructure throughout our region. Moving forward on our capital program, we remain focused on improving facilities and services for our customers while creating opportunities for domestic and international air travel. System preservation and resiliency throughout the rest of the program and at M.MAA remains a major focal point for our pro capital needs. Driven by the need to provide exceptional service to our customers in the safest, most reliable and efficient manner, system preservation projects include an airport-wide restroom renovation, aviation fuel storage replacement and expansion, electrical feeder replacements, airfield lighting vault upgrades, and passenger boarding bridge replacements. 
Additionally, as a designated reliever for BWI Marshall, improving the facilities at Martin State Airport remains a key component to maintaining an efficient regional aviation system that not only balances the needs of commercial operators, but includes corporate, personal, emergency response, and our military aircraft operators. After a short pause due to the pandemic, we are moving forward with a major multi-year terminal improvement to the center of, of operations at Southwest Airlines. Southwest is also our largest operator at BWI. The Concourse A-B connector and baggage handling system, as the Secretary mentioned earlier, will transform a major portion of this airport and create an enhanced travel experience for our passengers and support future growth for Southwest Airlines. These improvements include direct concourse to concourse connectivity, new food and retail concessions, modern restrooms, and expanded airline hold rooms. And all of this will be sitting on top of a brand new state-of-the-art sophisticated airline baggaging handling system. This large-scale project will be largely funded by airport revenue bonds, which will be issued for the which have been issued for the first time this past summer. And as our, our CFO would like to say, the bond issuance was well received both by our rating agencies and our investors. So we're looking forward to progress on that. We also are moving forward on major transportation, uh, excuse me, major transportation site preparation and utility work that support the construction of a aircraft maintenance base for Southwest Airlines. This will be the first such maintenance base here at the Northeast Corridor for Southwest. MAA will continue to support aviation and airports across Maryland by providing support to our 35 public use airports. For the statewide aviation grant program, we provide uh, airport improvement projects. MAA intends to administer 1.6 million in grants during fiscal year 22. Salisbury Regional Airport will receive $70,000 this year in state aviation grant assistance for their aircraft rescue and firefighting tools and equipment associated with the new apparatus, which I understand Tony has an opportunity to, to shake it down at the airport recently. So in closing, as the global industry uh, continues to recover and rebound across MAA, across the state, and certainly across the country, we are working to provide excellent service for our customers. We remain committed to excellent service and convenience for our customers, both at BWI Marshall and Martin State, and again, across the state of Maryland. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Transportation Secretary. Greg? Thank you, Ashish, and thank you to the whole MDOT team for the presentations today and, uh, and the opportunity to discuss our six-year budget. So we're happy to take any questions that you may have. If I may, my delegate out of, uh, I want to recognize Jay Meredith, our regional red engineer, and the good work that he does in the snow removal and keeping our streets safe. But, uh, uh, I am concerned about uh, noxious weeds and the control of them in the roadways. I mean, we've had some challenges with the gas pipeline going in and this, that, the other, what you could do mowing and this, that, the other. But, uh, uh, I mean, Johnson grass is still a concern, and, uh, and there's other noxious weeds that uh, we as the state need to be cognizant of that we're distributing to uh, the challenges for our agriculture communities. Uh, I want to recognize that. Thank you. Well, I, I guess I messed the uh, television up, but uh, I had a couple other things too, but I, I want to recognize him. He's got a fine crew and, sure. and you got a fine staff to we do. We have a great team, and I will tell you that um, I've been working pretty closely with Secretary Bartenfelder on the Knox yeah. issue issue and, and just trying to find the right solutions right. for that. So we do hear you on that issue. Ms. Neiser, thank you for being here. Uh, you have a good uh, people here in the Salisbury office as well, but it is challenging. When I went in there a few, uh, month or so ago, that there was only one kiosk working out of five that they had there. So, yeah, I, get <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wasn't asking for help or this, that, and the other, and they were willing to help me, but uh, <laughs> I, but I but I didn't have an appointment, so I couldn't get a card to go up to the next teller. But um, 
it is an unusual occurrence and actually since COVID I get daily reports on branch operations mm-hmm. I'm not familiar with exactly what day that was um, and uh, it was quickly sent to the IT team to ask why we would not more quickly um, inter- intervene when there were that many kiosks down so yeah I mean I we do look at those operations in a in a pretty uh, detailed way and also personally my brother uh, has a motorcycle and he's not got his renewal notice because you said he didn't have insurance and he's provided that that he does have insurance and he doesn't I told him to go to the kiosk was his best opportunity for the least path of uh, resistance so uh, <laughs> yeah but uh, but but I think the computer spitting out a lot of bad stuff well we'll need to make sure that, um, the insurance company will actually need to verify the insurance Oh, so let me get this one in. <laughs> 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 but I <laughs> it probably is, but I don't know how to cut that thing off. <laughs> I'd be happy to work with you afterwards, but we'll need the insurance company to verify that insurance. I'll work with you on that. Yeah, I'm Larry Dodd, by Comico County uh, Council President at this time, and um, I want to thank. Um, the, the secretary of the Maryland Department of Transportation and the entire state staff that came down to assist. And on behalf of Wicomico County Council, thank you and the citizens, thank you for attending. Um, I don't have much to say. I, I did want to say something and uh, the delegate reminded me I had to go get my motorcycle license at the end of uh, January and there was a long line at the DMV and there was a lot of elderly people standing out in the hot sun and it was almost 100 degrees out there and uh, if, if you could put up a tent that ever happens again yeah. for shade for these people but other than that I want to thank you for all the projects that you've already completed and some of the future projects because anything that benefits the quality of life of for the Wicomico County citizens and our visitors thank you very much and um, every day I went out for bike week between the Shorebird Stadium and Ocean City and I saw a lot of DOT trucks out there so I want to thank you for all the assistance there was a couple bad accidents out there and they were assisting uh, so thank you for everything you do to make Route 50 safe so thank you very much thank you mr. president good evening um, I'm Senator Mary Beth Carosa, and I first want to uh, thank you the whole MDOT team for coming down um, what I find um, extremely valuable, it's an opportunity for us to thank you in person because we bring numerous constituent concerns and questions and complaints to you and you are always responsive. Sometimes we have to you know, tell you the bad news, but what I always find is that there's a response and a commitment starting with the governor and his whole team on constituent service. I also wanted to know and wanted to say this in front of the um, president of the Wicomico County Council and the other council members that are here. One thing that we find very valuable as the delegation is the interaction the, um, that we have right before the public meeting. And why that's important for all of us, it, it does allow us to have that interaction on the priorities. And as I may remind everybody, Wicomico County is represented by uh, two state senators, five delegates, and Delegate Otto, who used to represent parts of Wicomico County and who knows in, re- in redistricting may as well. So, so and I also, um, Delegate Carl Anderton, who could not join us tonight, did um, want me to send um, you know his regrets um, as our chair of the Wicomico County delegation. I just wanted to highlight coming off of this dinner um, where we had the you know interaction between the state and the county and uh, the county executive John Pesota. I don't know if he's still here um, and his team outlining these priorities. But I wanted to underscore number one. Um, the Salisbury Regional Airport. Uh, You go on record, it's exciting what's going on out there. Uh, There has been a um, great deal of effort uh, and planning to prioritize the projects that are brought to you. Uh, We're excited about the Drone Center and moving forward with that. So obviously the runway extension uh, becomes a priority. Having FEMA as you know a site at the Salisbury Regional Airport is a priority. So wanted to just underscore the request that you heard earlier. Um, on the road uh, safety projects, I really appreciate the fact that in the presentation tonight um, that it, we were underscoring the safety issues and to, for you to hear 
you know, about the safety issues with the truck weight station, uh, with what's going on with the Salisbury Bypass and those merges. And Warwick Community College, you heard uh, Council Member Holloway really stressed, um, you know, it's exciting what's going on at Warwick with the groundbreaking of the new Applied Technology Center, um, but we are really seeing a lot of activity traffic-wise that I think we do need to address. Um, and then um, also appreciated the fact that we had our municipal um, priorities outlined as well. So um, I, and along with um, the, the two that I interact the most with, Jay Meredith and um, Christine Neiser, uh, personally want to thank you both. Um, you know, we you're hearing about constituent service. That's our top priority as a delegation. I know it's your top priority for Governor Hogan. And anything that we can do, even with that first person that greets people at MVA. I can tell you with my 82-year-old parents, if you just have somebody that greets them in a nice way, tells them it might be a little bit of a wait, but just, you know, direct them and greet them and are kind to them, that just cuts through so much of it. And I think that's what you're hearing with some of the specific issues that have been brought up tonight. So again, I wanted to um, take this opportunity to underscore the priorities you heard earlier. So that's my request. And then also to publicly thank you. Thank you. You didn't leave much for the rest of us, so thank you. <laughs> Delegate Wayne Hartman, I, I too want to thank you for being here. and. Um, kind of echo what um, the, the two previous people had said. When someone calls with a constituent issue and it's relating to MBA or state highway, I'm like, yes, we can do this because you guys are so responsive. So they're really my favorite constituent um, calls because you guys are truly that good. Um, so thank you. But um, one question kind of uh, global, you mentioned the electric vehicles increasing in charging stations. What, what are you doing, um, thinking in the future, with the deficit that's going to create in the funding sure. with electric vehicles and the disparity between what a, a traditional gas vehicle or diesel vehicle pays compared to an electric vehicle? Sure, there are, this, is a, this is a national issue, but you can very clearly see fuel efficiency in vehicles going up, more electric vehicles, um, the price of what we do in terms of infrastructure going up. Um, but the revenue is going down because the vehicles are more fuel efficient. So I think there's a there's a growing kind of concern about what's what's the model for for funding in the future. So uh, there's a few kind of pieces that are being debated around. Um, I do want to say first, I'm not supporting or not supporting any of them as I say them. <laughs> Come on, you can speak honestly. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there are a few. Some of them are more on the freight side, by you know putting. Uh, taxing on the on the freight movements and those types of things and then coming that back through the consumer goods. There's another option uh, that some groups are looking at in terms of paying per vehicle miles traveled, those types of things. Um, what Virginia did uh, was actually took, uh, you know, they, they came out very clearly uh, in the legislature and said, look, a four-door car is a four-door car. It takes up the same amount of space, whether it's electric or, or gas and established a rate for people that have electric vehicles that was X percentage of what the average rate is for a four-door car. Um, and those folks could either pay that rate or they could opt out and pay a per mile tax rate. And so that's the way they tackled it in Virginia. Um, but it's a, there's a lot being debated. Uh, there's a group right now, uh, the Eastern Transportation Coalition, which is essentially all of uh, my counterparts and myself from uh, Florida to Maine, including uh, Georgia and Tennessee and Kentucky. And so uh, we're doing some pilot work. Essentially, uh, what we've done on the vehicle miles traveled side is, is gotten some grants from the federal government and then have been doing data collection. So we have this little thing that you can sign up for the pilot program and kind of plug it into your car and uh, we'll send you a statement every month that says under a vehicle miles travel uh, program, you'll pay X amount, you would have paid X amount and this is what you paid in gas tax based on your fuel tax. What's, um, what's been interesting and in the results there are the benefits of that uh, tend to be on the rural side because your, um, your rate is your rate no matter what kind of vehicle you drive. And so if you're driving a, a, a big truck and working in a farm community, um, you're going to pay the same rate as somebody who is driving X amount. So you're not paying for your 
kind of miles per gallon piece you're paying per your mile piece and it ended up benefiting economically a lot of the rural areas with rural areas traveling so much further i mean i, I put twenty five to thirty thousand miles on the vehicle compared to fifteen thousand right. for for others how i don't understand how so it would benefit do you, so do you, rural. Do you, i don't want to get too personal but do you drive a car that has great fuel efficiency no so <laughs> So if you're if if you're a large SUV <laughs> right trucks. so you're driving a large truck or an SUV if your neighbor is driving a, a, a four door car that's getting forty miles to the gallon and you two are driving the same distance you're paying the same rate so you're not paying based on your fuel efficiency you're paying based on your mileage so that's doing the way that it gets done. Yes, it's more on the vehicle miles traveled side, right. and that's just kind of a research program that's happening out there today. Replace it, something that's going to be added to. Yeah, and I think you know what's going to be interesting is um, you know so we as a state uh, have raised the gas tax you know several years ago when it was a very tough lift uh, for many in the legislature, and and um, and and so the federal government has not change their rates in many many years and and so that's a big debate in dc right now yeah remember my original question it was about the disparity in electric vehicles not paying towards not. right so well, i think we've gotten off track from that so <laughs> i'll go back to my original sure. but um and i'll put on the record i'm not a fan of the um, pay per mile kind sure. of thing so um secondly mba we talked earlier still by appointment only i mean so many people go there i haven't been there myself um see the disappointment only turn around it's you know not people don't go to the mba very often in their life so it's still like surprise them news if we can get those offices open you know on a normal basis as soon as possible i think it would be a you know so many other people are op operating in COVID. um you know i don't understand the delay in returning to to normal um i think we need to get back to normal so if you could we do have Keep. processes in place for those things. So we do have greeters um, with tablets that, that greet you when you first come in. And so it depends on the circumstance. If they have the capacity, we, we do at times accept walk-ins. I wouldn't say that publicly, but I'll say that to you. Um, but I know. But, um, but we also, if we can't accept them right then and there, we'll make an appointment for them to come back at 3 o'clock. And we do it for them. They don't have to do anything themselves. So there's processes in place for people who either aren't comfortable with the technology, they can also call our call center, we'll make an appointment for them so they don't have to be computer literate. There are a lot of benefits that come with appointments, so, um, you know, when we started introducing appointments, we talked about that 15 minute guarantee, right? And, and I know it wasn't that way during COVID because there were a lot of folks who were coming, there were a lot of folks with expired licenses. We're now getting back to normal operation. Our wait time today on average was 17 minutes statewide. And when, it was, and when I looked at Salisbury and Easton, they were considerably below that, less than 10 it, it, when it came to Easton. So we have the ability to really deliver a different level of service to our customers that frankly excites us. And based on the feedback we've heard from customers, they really like the appointments. Sure, and maybe a hybrid so of appointments and walk-ins because some people, you know, they don't have that ability to create those appointments. Mm -hmm. and just go in thinking that you know it's business as usual from sure. their year their experiences past so sure. maybe a hybrid would be great but just to allow people to walk in and take care of their their business last question sure. the vehicle shortage is that mm -hmm. creating any shortage in revenue for the state with um titling and things like that because it is or the higher prices making up those differences there, there are two issues that are yeah. kind of impacting yeah. us right now one is, or three three issues that one's helping us so you know the dealer incentives that are out there on new cars are really helping the interest rates are really helping us um the the used car market is pretty challenging right now there's a, a lot of shortage uh, of used cars however um we've had this emerging market we're exporting a lot of used cars out of the port of baltimore today that we weren't doing last year um, but the largest obstacle we have on the, mar on the vehicle market today is the chip shortage. And so the computer chip shortage. So many people don't realize that, um, you know, when, I, when a vehicle comes into the Port of Baltimore, it's not road ready like you ordered it. Um, it's actually put together finally at the port. So it, the car that comes into the Port of Baltimore is a basic car. And so they're putting the additives, they're putting the accessories, they're doing the detailing right there at the Port of Baltimore. Uh, and, and so we have large contracts with, with a lot of vehicle manufacturers 
um, and, and this chip shortage, uh, just by way of, of one example, and it's not a car that everyone owns, but uh, Land Rover, uh, a new Land Rover has uh, more than 150 computer chips in it. And so it's not just like one chip. So we actually have people now that are buying cars um, and not having certain functionality and saying, I'll I just want my car now, but I'll come back in a few weeks and you'll make my radio work or you'll make something else work. Uh, just because they want that. The challenging part is is your warranty starts when you leave that lot. So you're you're kind of dealing with that piece. But but yes. So the chip shortage more than the vehicle shortage is 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 affecting us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks again for being here. Absolutely. Thank you. My turn. Hi, Senator Addy Eckerton. Sorry, I was late to the party along with my colleague, Delegate Johnny Mounts. We had three, just three other you know, events on the Upper Shore, and it, I keep forgetting it takes an hour to get here. It takes 45 minutes from Cambridge, from Easton to Annapolis, but it takes an hour from Easton to Salisbury. So I'm um, sorry we couldn't be with uh, both Council and you all to debate the and discuss the priorities, but I think my colleagues have stated most of those. I have a couple of questions and then a couple of comments. Um, first of all, Aish, for the port, I mean for the airport, um, we were there, I'm trying to think, our committee was there pre-COVID, and we went in the back room to visit the baggage uh, system back there, which really it needs an overhaul. What's the due date on that overhaul, or time frame on that? So construction is going to start, and it's going to be a phased process, so at least two years, and so we, we believe 2022 is the expectation end of 22 but if i may delegate or excuse me senator i'd like to get back to you on that one okay a certain num date yeah i'd appreciate that because my understanding was and that's been what almost two years now did we lose some ground with the pandemic we we did so just kind of there's a couple of pieces that are important over at the airport especially with our partnership with southwest airlines so the board of public works just approved a maintenance hangar facility for us on site at BWI. It's only the second maintenance facility that Southwest Airlines has. So what that is, is they're investing uh, 50, 60 million dollars into that facility. And that shows us that they're gonna be with us as a partner for a long time. Um, we have two components to help facilitate their growth. Uh, one is the concourse AB connector. So a, a con the ability to connect those two concourses without having to go back through security and the baggage handling system. We delayed it a year because the project was being paid for by airport revenue bonds. And when the riders, when the, when the air service went down, the revenue wasn't there and the bond market wasn't great. But we just issued those bonds a few weeks ago, got a positive rating back, and those projects are back on track and getting ready to start. The Board of Public Works just approved uh, the first phase of the AB connector, and we'll be back with two to three more over the next several months for some approvals. Uh, the, the most important thing to remember on the baggage handling system is um, it's, uh, you know, I thought, uh, I always thought bridge construction was challenging when you're trying to, <laughs> like, uh, build a bridge in the same place and maintain traffic at the same time. We have to build a baggage handling system that's going to exist in the exact same space that current baggage handling system does mm -hmm. and not have any disruption in the baggage handling at the airport. And so that's a pretty complex and complicated process. So we're using a CMAR contract, so it's a construction management on risk at risk, it allows us to bring the contractor on board with us and help us with the final design packages so that we don't design something that the contractor just can't implement. It allows us to have them with us as we're finalizing those plans. But uh, those plans should all be locked up and underway by the spring. Great, thank you very much. I thought I heard a disconnect and I just wasn't sure mm -hmm. what that was all about. Uh, I did have another um, couple of other uh, comments, you know, we probably will be revisiting the whole issue of how do we spend our highway user revenues? Mm -hmm. Does it go strictly to highway user revenues or what about mass transit? And I know last year at the end of the session, our committee said we're probably going to be tackling that in the next mm -hmm. couple of years. So any of the ideas that you all have, I think are going to be greatly appreciated. and kind of would expedite that whole process because that, as you know, has been very tense uh, and very controversial in the past. And we still hear, I mean, every single day I hear 
about the need or lack of transportation. And I know we've worked to have a great system, um, you know, through the Tri-County Council. Uh, but one of the things that I learned, and it's interesting, um, and these may not seem related, but they will be related. I came down into Salisbury tonight, and all of a sudden there were two dark figures in front of me. And it was two kids on motor bikes, not motor scooters. Motor bikes, and they pulled right out in front of me, no lights, no license, no nothing, and were weaving in and out of traffic. And I really had to slow down and think twice about what I was doing very carefully. I just share that with you because I see that all the time in Cambridge and I'm always thinking, where are we missing and teaching our young people about highway safety? When we were talking about apprentice programs over in Dorchester County, Senator Rose Pep and I were visiting some of the programs, we found out that a lot of kids are not are choosing not to drive. And I did not know about that, and I asked them, why is that? And they said it's the high cost of driver's ed, and it's the high cost of cars, and insurance, and gas, and all that goes with it. I just share that with you because I think that's kind of unfortunate in a rural area when we want to get kids connected to jobs and we want safe um, motorists on our highway and you do want you do want people to have that skill i think that's in a very important adult skill so we may need to rethink that and you all may be able to help us with that as well it is i know well i mean i'll speak from experience i my youngest daughter is 20 years old does not have a driver's license Right. has no desire to drive none at all no yeah. desire to drive at all <laughs> and um, she just never even thought about it and yeah so, we we didn't pick it up somebody said you know schools in today where are all the cars in the parking lot and the teacher said kids don't drive what do you mm -hmm. mean where are all the cars in the parking lot so, well this is a rural area does mm house -hmm. everybody get to school well that's a whole other subject of whether kids get to school or not this year. So I'm just, um, just putting it on our, everybody's radar uh, screen. But I just wanted to thank you for being very responsive. Uh, Mr. Meredith is always super about that. When we need help with ditches, he's there. When we need help with negotiating right of ways, he's there. So. You know, you really do have a top-notch staff uh, and are very responsive to us, and we deeply appreciate that. So we want to make sure going forward with all of our legislative and budget hurdles, I know there is a surplus, but, you know, it's here today, gone tomorrow. And, Not in the trust fund. And, We've got and it all I, I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all very much. Great. Johnny. Well, sure. I, I forgot mm -hmm. to mention, thank you for your effort uh, last week to all the counties between the Bay Bridge and Worcester County. Absolutely. Um, thank you for the effort uh, between the Bay Bridge and Worcester County during the H2OI, the event that I think everyone is aware of that lives on the shore and beyond. Um, you shared some numbers earlier that were mm -hmm. remarkable. I don't know if you yeah, have... Very, very successful operation uh, for us. So just those of you who are not familiar, we had some challenges in Ocean City with H2OI the last several years. Um, and so we worked very coordinated with uh, all the local law enforcement officers. Uh, what we did, and uh, Administrator Neiser, uh, through the Governor's Highway Safety Office, we administered some grants to the local law enforcement agencies between the Bay Bridge and here, and um, uh, had en enhanced patrols looking for you know unsafe vehicles, those types of things. But uh, we pulled multiple uh, intoxicated drivers off the road, headed to Ocean City, and we had uh, 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 one or two uh, drug arrests. So I, I believe you said nine DUIs mm -hmm. before Worcester County. So meaning Wicomico County, Queen Anne's County, yeah. in between. So between thank the Bay you Bridge for, and Ocean City. Thank you for that effort. It makes all the counties on the shore safer. So thank you, and I hope that continues. Mr. Secretary, if I may, to uh, address Senator Eckhart, your immediate question about the baggage handling system schedule. Uh, through, the, through modern technology, I was able to uh, ping our uh, Get the experts. answer. Go Google. Exactly. So our, our chief engineer has uh, provided me a date. End of 2025 is the correct date of the full project completion. 
operational. That's when up the upper level and the baggage handling system exactly will be operational. There will be phases of this effort throughout the years, and my my memory was off, so I apologize for for your information. End of 2025 is the target today. Well, thank you. We'll check it out. And oh, I I meant to mention I actually traveled through the pandemic, mm -hmm. and BWI was the best, the best. Okay. Your folks were all courteous, <clears throat> um, patient, um, and just very um, precise about their jobs. Great. They did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be happy to pass that to the right but people with a lot of hard workers. That, and I went to several airports, and Thank they you. weren't always appreciated. Mm -hmm. We we'll definitely Here's share it. Thank you. Uh, and, I, and I also I apologize for being late with Senator Eckert. We got jammed up. And um, to the county council, thank you for hosting us. And uh, it's rude not to be able to attend, but it's tough when you got to be in multiple places at the same time. Um, I wanted to m make sure to get here tonight to see the team. Um, I have not had an opportunity to say hello since all this uh, pandemic started. And, uh, and you know, everybody's uh, saluting you and thanking you. And I want to add myself to that. Uh, I don't know there's uh, between Jay and Chrissy, I think uh, all the phone calls I've had to make directly to them during this difficult time, and they've been quick to fix you know all of our problems. You can't fix them all. And, and I haven't heard people anybody mention Pilar's name either. And she's you know, there. yeah, and she's been through a heck of a year also, so I don't think she, I'm talking about you <laughs> singing, your, <laughs> singing your praises. And, and I don't want to uh, open up, you know, I missed the uh, the presentation. I have the booklets, and I, and I appreciate the investment in Wacomico County. You know, we've got some, some big things going on here. But uh, I just have a, I, most of my issues I work with are constituent issues. Mm -hmm. And I, for the life of me, I don't know the answer to this question, but for, I know driver's licenses, dri your driver's license currently has to be valid. Um, your vehicle registration uh, on the on the they have to be valid now, right? I I, I was a little confused because we've gone through. I was I, I'm I'm glad we gave some deference and allowed people to extend, but that 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 time period is over. They need to have everything up to date now. Is that correct? Right. There's 30. only there's only one small extension, and that's actually co covered by the federal government, and it's for some CDL holders with their medical certificate card. But even that is. The dates are shifting back, so it's really only people that expired within the last four to six months that they get an extension. But everything else um, is required to be valid at this point. And, and then I think I read somewhere in the past month that, is it true, is the red line back, is that, has that been revived through some federal investment in Baltimore City? Is that? Uh, it's not an active project for us right now. Okay. And then uh, I, I want to thank you for verifying that for me. And then... Um, uh, Senator Eckert and I had uh, the pleasure, and I know um, you've got a, a bunch of projects, but I wanted to propose this to you to consider. Um, as you come across the um, Malchus Bridge in Cambridge, um, the American Legion there has just uh, installed a new parking lot. And, um, and the parking lot is a porous uh, asphalt parking lot. And, uh, you know, we, we're de we deal with a lot of drainage issues, a lot of runoff issues. This parking lot is expensive. It is a very expensive parking lot, but it's amazing uh, w the way the water just does goes right through the blacktop. And it may be something you want to look at. In not you don't want to do this on roadways and things like that. But there may be a couple of areas that could be of interest to you. Yeah, I, Doug, I actually worked pretty closely with the American Legion on that project. Uh, in my state highway administrator role, and so we were happy to see that work. You know, DNR's got that little parking lot next door to it too, but yeah. we've tried uh, some of those pervious pavers over the years. They're, they're just a little more maintenance, so you gotta find the right treatment at the right place, um, but that parking lot location located exactly where it is next to that waterway is, is the perfect location for that. Well then, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your work <laughs> on, the, on the parking lot. Wrong county, right idea. <laughs> so, but it's great to see everyone. We'll look for the next one. Yeah. It's, it's great to see everyone. Thank you.
I have another thing, and I, and I didn't think of it earlier, but Senator Eckhart um, mentioned it when she said she saw the two motorbikes, and, and they're actually dirt bikes. We have a problem here. It, it's very serious. Um, they're ATVs on the road, and they're dirt bikes, and just last week I saw 25 of them go right by my street doing um, wheelies and almost caused an accident, and uh, earlier in the summer, a guy and his wife were riding on Route 50 on a dirt bike, untagged, and I believe they ended up in shock trauma. Um, so what is it that we can do to, to prevent that? Because I know some of the municipalities aren't chasing motorcycles. I don't think our sheriff's department's chasing them. I know Maine and New Hampshire, they require the um, ATVs and the dirt bikes to, ha to be tagged and registered, not tagged, but um, stickers, they register them. The kids have to do um, uh, motorcycle safety classes and they have to wear their helmets. But what's the incentive uh, for someone like me and other law-abiding citizens to tag my vehicle and if I get a police car behind me why don't I just take off if they're not going to chase so we do require a titling sticker in the same way that you're referring to some other states do so clearly if you use it on your private property and never leave there we would never know you had it but that titling sticker there's a number on there just like your tag number is law enforcement has access to that information you're right I mean there are definitely policies by various jurisdictions about not chasing and those ATVs some of them right. go pretty fast too but state law does require those to be titled um, but they're not doing that so we do have a fair number of them that are titled right. I'm sure there are many that are not um, part of the issue that uh, the reason the policy reason it went through was because a lot of these were being stolen and they really didn't have any ownership documents so that was really right. the original justification for trying to do that titling sticker but it has right. provided an enforcement mechanism mm -hmm. yeah and, and I know I just uh, since constituents were complaining about it just yesterday I got online and googled and I saw New York City is now impounding mm -hmm. these vehicles these dirt bikes and they're crushing them I think that I, they'd be better off selling them somewhere else if they don't want them in their city ship them down south or something but that's an option um, I don't want to see dirt bikes good bikes or ATVs crushed but we need to do something because it is a crisis and, and um, it's scaring the drivers around here because a lot of times they go flying by you real fast and it, it really startles them and more people are going to get injured or killed so if there's something that we can do please let us know so thank you thank you any further questions members of the public you're welcome to ask any questions okay. thanks for having us Thank <laughs> you.